Happy birthday, Mr. President. And after the performance, we invited all the performers and the Kennedy family to come to our home. And the Vice President was with President Kennedy. And of course, that evening, uh, all the eyes were on the Kennedys and on Marilyn and other stars like Maria Callas and Jimmy Durante and many others who were there. And the president was a bit alone. And, and he modestly, while the others were performing for each other and, and, and uh, meeting and talking, he climbed halfway up a set of stairs and sat down and was looking to the crowd from above. And I thought, this is not fair, you know, somebody should pay attention to the vice president. And I sat next to him on the stack. And we had the first conversation there. And um, that night I admired him for his ability to stand back, you know, to let the Kennedys enjoy the evening and be the stars of the evening. And. Um, I think that was about it on a personal level. Um, of course, when President Kennedy was assassinated, the President Johnson took over, and he was in a terrible position when one thinks of the situation without any preparation for the change. And I think he felt lonely and uh, probably even frightened, you know, by the his new uh, obligations to this country. And uh, I remember that <coughs> my late husband, Arthur Krim, was very distraught when Kennedy was assassinated. He had uh, gotten to the point of admiring the man. He was serving him as uh, head of his finance committee for the National Democratic Party. And it was also for Arthur the first experience in political life and he enjoyed it, and he was enthusiastic about it, and enthusiastic about President Kennedy. And then suddenly this man disappears, and Arthur said to me, that's it, Matilda, I've had it. I want to get out of politics. And he was then summoned by President Johnson, who said, Arthur, you know, I can't do it alone. I need you, and I need others, I need members of the cabinet to stay with me and let make it to go. And give me one year, more year of your life to work with me. And Arthur, of course, could not say no, and he stayed. And then so, something interesting happened because there couldn't be more different people, you know, than President Johnson and Arthur Crimp, who was then, uh, he was an attorney by training. He was the head of a motion picture company, United Artists. His life was New York and Los Angeles. We had never been to Texas, in fact, before. And, but these two <coughs> really clicked. And I think that my husband had a reputation for being not only extremely <coughs> competent and loyal and uh, effective in his work, but also for being a person capable of great discretion. And I think this is a side of him that President Johnson liked, somebody he could trust, somebody who would be loyal to him. And they worked together extremely well, I think. They, I, never re I don't remember a moment of dissension between them, disagreement. Uh, Arthur had, came to admire President Johnson enormously. And uh, I think it was reciprocal because President Johnson really treated us increasingly as personal friends. And we then started coming and spend weekends with him at his ranch first. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> we started spending weekends with him at his ranch. And this happened so frequently that it became a little difficult for me because I was a working scientist in those days. And um, I was spending the whole week at my lab. I had a child at home, so I had to spend time with her too. And, uh, and, and then Friday night I had to pack and go to Texas. <laughs> and it was difficult. And I said to Arthur, you know, it's wonderful, but let's try to have a little place, a little cabin somewhere where we can be alone once in a while and have a, a long night's sleep. And this is how we came to build this house where we are today. 
a nice little ranch in the hill country. And I'm so happy we have it and enjoyed it for so long. Well, while we're on that, let's, I was going to talk about that later, but let's talk about the, the building of this uh, and, and President Johnson's interest in it at the time. Well, um, we were lucky that we, we, being here, saw President Johnson um, when he was, he could be totally himself, you know. And one, one aspect of his character is that he liked to play with things. And he played with his little boat on the lake here and so forth. And one day he said to me, because he knew we intended to buy a property somewhere, he said, Matilda, I want you to have a place here in the hill country and to give me a birthday party for my birthday, August the 27th. And this was early May. So I said, Mr. President, that's not possible. You know, one can't build a house in three months. He said, oh, yes, one can. <laughs> And he, he called a wonderful architect, Roy White, who was an expert in the style of the old homesteads here in this area of the, this part of the country. So I guess he had the designs almost ready in advance. He designed this, uh, the architecture here in, in, within days. May the 20th, we came on the ground here and we staked where the house should be. And on August the 27th, I had a birthday party for him here. Of course, it helps to have a president of the United States <laughs> to push things along. But it was wonderful because it was all done, and this was also something uh, President Johnson uh, made a question of pride. He was proud of the workmanship of the local people local talents, and we employed only local people to build this house. And they did it so well and so fast. And so well, because we never needed any repair. It's still standing exactly as it was, except for some additions. But the, the first structure is still here, and we never had a problem with it. In, in, <coughs> during his administration, I know that uh, <coughs> that he relied upon Arthur for uh, advice on a good many things. Yeah. But I think that in addition to that, he relied on you uh, separately for advice and counsel on, uh, <coughs> I know he sought out your, your, your feelings on a number of things. <laughs> I don't know if that was justified, but um, see, President Johnson was a very complex person, very complex. He was also the smartest man on earth, we thought, Arthur and I. He, I'm sure you know, you know, he had this kind of gut feelings that were always so right to things. He had, however, and it, that is a personal opinion, I think, but I know that some other people share it. He had a kind of um, almost an inferiority complex when he compared himself and his education, his experience in life with that of, uh, you know, uh, graduates of Harvard University, of which the Kennedy administration was full. And um, he, had, uh, he was intimidated by people with big degrees. And w one thing with me is that he was, I know, very impressed by the fact that I spoke several languages and that I was a PhD. And that, by, you know, in his mind, I think, gave me a certain credit to start with. And then he was impressed by the fact that uh, <clears throat> I lived in New York, and I moved in the entertainment industry, you know, which to President Johnson was another world too, uh, of elegance and sophistication, which was a bit of unjustified as an opinion, but then I think he had this opinion. So the, the mix of all these things with me was considered very attractive to him. And uh, yes, he did consult me, and if, in fact, he asked me to help him on certain occasions. And one was a funny one. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> yeah, maybe I should. Thank you. As I said, I was a working scientist. 
Uh, one evening in New York, I had a group of 30 people in my house to look at a film on viruses. And the, the head of the institution where I was working, the uh, Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York, uh, was there. And in the middle of seeing our film on viruses, the phone rang and it was President Johnson. And he said, Matilda, can you move fast? Can I interrupt a second? Yeah. He's, what happened was the phone rang and the president of Sloan Kettering. Oh, yeah, yeah, I was coming to that. OK, because that's before you even got on the phone. He, he answered the phone. No, no, he did not answer. Arthur answered or somebody else. No, because I remember the line, president of what? Do you remember? He said, Matilda, yeah, but he didn't he say it to the president of the United no, 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 States. No, no, he said it to the operator. To me. The operator or said, the president um, is calling. Dr. Krim there, it's the president calling. Yeah. He said, the president of what? <laughs> yeah. She said, the president of the United States. Yes, yeah, something like this. He said, the president of what? And, um, and I was embarrassed to ask the president of my institute to let me go in the middle of, uh, you know, uh, an invitation, a social evening. And um, I wanted to be sure that he would, my, the president of St. Catherine would, would uh, understand and let me go. So I put him on the phone and I could hear him. Uh, after saying the president of what, you know, and, and sounding annoyed because he was interrupted in the middle of seeing this film, I heard him say, yes, sir, yes, sir, of course, sir, thank you, sir, <laughs> you know, <laughs> so I knew I could go. So I, I took the phone and I asked President Johnson, why did you ask if I can move fast? Well, he said, you know, the Russians have this guy Gagarin who was circling, you know, he was one of the first astronauts, maybe the first one in Russia, to go around the planet. And we have our own people. And Gagarin is in Paris for the International Aeronautical event. And we don't have, any, we're not represented there. And I want our three astronauts to go uh, to Paris. And they are at the White House with their wives because I gave them a dinner tonight. But these girls don't know how to dress, you know? <laughs> so you, I would like you to come over to the White House tonight. You leave tomorrow morning with them. You take the ladies to dress properly and, uh, and the men to the aeronautical fair. And he said, you are a scientist, you know the language, and of course I speak French. And, uh, and, and you, you know, organize this trip properly. So, and short notice was really short notice, uh, two hours, you know. I had to, fortunately, there was then a plane leaving New York, going to Washington late at night. I managed to, took that, to take that, I, Arthur drove me there. I had to take my own dresses and long dresses because I was sure there would be formal receptions in Paris. And I had less than two hours to pack and so forth. I had one hour to pack and go. And I arrived at the White House at two o'clock in the morning. Uh, the, the advantage that night is that I slept in the Queen's room because all the other rooms were occupied by the astronauts and their parties. But we were got, we, the wake up call was four o'clock in the morning. And uh, we had all to go down and take a chopper and go to Andrews, I think it was called. Uh, it is called in Washington, the, you know, the military. Uh, airport and we flew to Paris and in, when we arrived in Paris of course there was a reception committee and a band playing it was a, a big show and the first thing I had to do is to arrange for these ladies to be able to go shopping for dresses and I couldn't do that and translate for the husbands at the same time you know so fortunately I had one good friend in Paris by the name of Charlotte I called Charlotte and uh, she was a psychoanalyst, so she was not in fashion either. But at least she told me immediately on the phone when I told her of my quandary, you know, having to build a wardrobe for these three American ladies. She said, you know, one of my best friends is the head of the Dior boutique. And they sell everything there, you know, from shoes to dresses to handbags and so on. Send them over. And thank God the Dior boutique took <laughs> took care of them very well and I could spend the day at the show with the husbands and uh, you know translating during interviews and so forth 
And that was one, one thing the you know, president asked me to do for him. The, uh, <coughs> the great albatross <coughs> that President Johnson had, of course, was Vietnam. Yes. Did he ever talk to you about Vietnam? Or did you ever talk to him uh, about it? Well, no. I didn't talk to him about military or political issues even. With my husband, yes, he did talk about these things. But I overheard many conversations. And, and it was clear that President Johnson continued the operation in Vietnam and increased it because he felt it, he owed this to President Kennedy. It was a Kennedy policy and he had to continue and, and win. And so he kept, he kept enlarging our involvement there. He was, uh, I think he was uh, internally suffering a lot because he knew very well that the cost of Vietnam would undermine his ability to carry on the war on poverty. That was his, really his highest priority. And uh, he was very, what is the term, conflicted, you know. And he couldn't show it. He, you know, he was a leader, so he had to, uh, to appear to be 100% to have his heart into the Vietnam War. And I knew he didn't. And he was conflicted also because it would not have been his priority. His priority was domestic programs. But he was doing it very much, and he, uh, certainly in the beginning, it was his idea that to be loyal to the previous president, he had to continue in that task of fighting in Vietnam. Um, Strongly on the advice of the former Kennedy. Well, sure, of course, it, uh, all his advisors were former Kennedy cabinet members, specifically Mr. McNamara. Yeah. Um, at some point, we, we knew that he hesitated so much that, uh, that Arthur, I remember, and I was with him then, we often went to the presidential bedroom early in the morning when he was getting a massage and receiving the first, you know, memos in the program of the day and so on. So that day, he was going to propose to increase the force in Vietnam by 200,000 people. And Arthur said, no, Mr. President, don't do it. This time I have to tell you really, please don't do it. Because, and I, and I don't remember exactly the circumstances around that date, but I remember the president saying, really, I shouldn't do it. And Arthur said, no, you shouldn't do it. And he didn't, never did it. So I don't know to what extent, you know, it was Arthur's influence and a little mind I was chiming in, <laughs> but, uh, or not, but he didn't do it. You and Arthur were in the White House on March 31st, 1968, yeah. the day that President Johnson announced that he was not going to um, uh, run again. And I know uh, from the record that uh, you were uh, uh, among the first to know that he was going to make that announcement. Do you remember that day and what he Oh, remember? yes, who could forget a day like that? Of course I remember. Well, I remember that um, the discussion around his running again or not um, was held over a long period, you know, at least a year he was considering. And I remember that uh, Mrs. Johnson and Linda strongly wanted him. They, they knew how hard his work was and, and how um, I don't know what we uh, yeah, more than burdensome, you know, almost destructive. Dis yeah, dis destructive, not destructive, destructive. <coughs> his, uh, his burden was, and, and, and how he took the burden, you know. He, he was a, <coughs> it, it really, yeah, excuse me? He internalized. Well, yeah, I don't know. He lived it so uh, acutely, I don't know how to say it, that they, his family felt he has to leave because it's going to kill him. 
Also, there was a family history in his family, you know, of early death due to heart attacks and so forth. So all this was lingering, was heavy on their mind, including his. And Mrs. Johnson tried to encourage him to go back to the ranch and live a few years happily without carrying such a burden. I remember that Arthur Quim and me and others were strongly against his quitting because, first of all, all politicians were saying that he had a very good chance of being re-elected. Excuse me. <coughs> he had a very good chance of being re-elected in '68, and and we felt it was so important to the country for him. For him, he had by then decided he sta had started negotiations with North Vietnam. He had decided to shrink and, term and end the, the war in Vietnam. And we felt he was necessary to this process and he was necessary to the country it, that uh, indeed had a lot of domestic prob problems to face also. And he was so deeply engaged in that aspect of his job. <coughs> so we tried to tell the president, and particularly Arthur did, um, to, to stay, to run again. And quite the contrary, Arthur felt that he, he was, because this was so much his life, personally uh, also, that it would be resigning that would do him harm. He would not be able to live long without this being part of the political world. In any case, after a year of this kind of discussions, Lady Bird one day came to us, and that was already way into the months of March, days before the, his announcement, saying, you know, Arthur and Matilda, I thought of it, I think he should stay. It would be better. But it was too late, because the president already had made up his mind, and, and it would have been, he just couldn't face starting again, you know, the argument whether he should stay or go. And he decided to go and to tell the public, March 31st. And uh, it, was, it was very sad, uh, a very sad day when this happened. And uh, also, I think that it was indicative that he had nobody around but us and Lady Bird and Linda. And uh, of course, the cameraman. But it, it was really, he was really a very lonely man. In, uh, uh, in uh, December, um, one month before President Johnson died, I've forgotten the year right now, but it was a month before he died, uh, there was, a, there was a, a symposium at the LBJ Library on civil mm -hmm. rights. Yeah. And you were there for that. Now that was the, the culmination of uh, his four years of retirement. You were very much a part of his life during those four years of yes. his retirement. Uh, can you reflect on, on anything during that period and also the Civil Rights Symposium? Yeah. Well, the Civil Rights Symposium was wonderful and, and he was not well, I remember that day. And uh, he had problems with his heart, uh, which was, a, as I said, part of a family history. So he was, in addition to feeling well, he was also worrying, of course. But he made it a point to be there and to speak. And it was almost a triumph in his life because civil rights had been so much central to his, uh, to his policies domestically. Um, it was a great day. And uh, I don't need to tell you, in addition to civil rights legislation, how much other good legislation was passed under his presidency more than any other in recent years. And things as fundamental as Medicare, how could we not have Medicare? And, um, well, I don't want to go into the history because I'm not an expert, but I know it's an enormous amount. Also, um, equality and the right to uh, the urban, yeah, what, what's the name of this piece of urban legislation? No, no. Okay, well, cut it. Um, we won't use that. <coughs> In any case, um, yeah, during the, the four years after his resignation, we saw him quite often. 
And for a while, yes, he kind of revived, you know, being free and liberated of burdens. He let his hair grow. He started looking a little hippie himself, which was amusing. <laughs> but, um, but he missed the political life, nevertheless. You, you uh, alluded earlier to um, the fact that he was a complex and complicated man. Yes. Uh, this is a, a somewhat difficult, but as you reflect on him, how would you sum him up as a, as a person? Oh, <laughs> it's difficult to say because he was so complex. I think he was a great man. That's the best word. And he was imposing. He was not only physically a big man and an imposing man, but he, he was great because uh, he had a great heart, he had a great intelligence, and he put them both to work in, uh, in fantastic ways. And I wish the contemporary public would understand how much we owe this man. For the last number of years, Dr. Krim, you have been uh, waging an heroic uh, uh, battle against AIDS. Uh, suppose that had happened while President Johnson, suppose you had that that a post uh, and, and taken on that role uh, during his administration, and he was uh, you had made him aware. How do you think he would have responded? And how do you think the whole huh. situation might have might have been if, if he was in the White House? He would have led. You know that's the difference with what we had after him. Uh, first of all, he was compassionate. Secondly, he was unprejudiced against any minority. In fact, one of his best personal friends was a gay man, Walter Jenkins, and he remained n not, you know, publicly close to Jenkins, but personally, yes. And uh, he would have responded totally differently from the other. You know, President Reagan did not mention the word AIDS until six years into the epidemic, in 1987, for the first time, and it was the first and the last time uh, we, we didn't have the leadership at the highest level that we needed in a situation like this. Because it was really with it, a case where we had to convince the public, even before the problem became big, but the potential of, was big, to have an enormous you know, epidemic, an enormous problem in the world. Well, this has happened because we could have contained the epidemic early on, and we did not. We wasted five years until the grassroots, you know, the people themselves formed the new organizations we needed to deal with AIDS. That took five years uh, without virtually no support and, and certainly no leadership from the White House. And that would have been totally di different with President Johnson. He would have addressed the public, he would have explained what this is, and he would have led the fight against AIDS. While we're on that subject, what is your out, what is, what, what, how do you look upon the problem now? What is your outlook for it? I, I think it's a terrible problem. It's the worst epidemic in human history. I'm talking worse than the Black Death, you know, the plague of the Middle Ages, because the numbers infected and affected already by the disease are bigger than anything we have seen. There are other diseases that affect as many people, such as malaria, tuberculosis, cancer, but they don't kill everybody. These AIDS kills and has killed so far everybody. And we have better drugs, we can prolong life, people, patients can lead lives that are a little more comfortable because they have fewer complications when they're treated with the appropriate cocktail of drugs but they don't survive AIDS, they still die of it. And it's a terrible problem because we don't have a vaccine to prevent it yet. We can prevent it only through admonitions and, uh, and people exercising the personal discipline needed to protect themselves from catching the infection. That's all we have, we don't have a vaccine. And in terms of treatment, as I just said, we can improve lives and prolong them, but we cannot save them yet. And the numbers in the world, you know, we have 40 million people living with, with AIDS today. 
uh, we think the, the UN AIDS, the agency that deals with AIDS globally, has estimated that 68 million people will have it by 1910. Uh, <coughs> and uh, of course, the, it's one person out of 40 or so with HIV or AIDS that gets treated. The others don't get anything because most of the others are in the developing world where these medications are not available for economic reasons. And reasons of distribution that are difficult to administer the new uh, anti-AIDS drugs. They require an infrastructure not only of medical competence but also laboratory technical competence to guide the doctors on what drugs to give and when and in what combination, and that does not exist overseas, only to a certain extent in Europe. Through the years, you have had a, a, a most distinguished uh, career, um, which is uh, composed mm -hmm. of hard work, among other uh, mm -hmm. things. Uh, do you ever contemplate retirement? If I have what? Retirement. Do you ever think about retiring? Uh, Yes, I thought of it many times. I tried to discuss it, and I was told, no, Matilda, you're not the retiring type. So I'm still here. <laughs> well, I, I want to ask one final question. Uh, this has been about President Johnson, uh, uh, but uh, it's not solely about him. I want to ask you about your relations with Lady Bird Johnson. They have continued uh, through the years, have they not? Oh, uh, yes. I adore Lady Bird. She's a fantastic woman. and. Um, she married somebody who was not easy to live with, I can tell you that. Uh, President Johnson was moody, was impulsive. Um, he would go from, you know, being in a joking mood to being in a very demanding mood. And, uh, you know, like calling Lady Bird 20 minutes since before lunchtime and saying Lady Bird, or Bird, he would call her. I'm bringing 20 guests and I want my tapioca pudding, you know. <laughs> and, and she, she uh, obliged. She made herself as flexible and, and uh, uh, how can I say, loving as possible with, with great uh, character. It takes strength of character to do that. And she has done it. And she's, uh, she's been a devoted mother and wife and she's been a good, uh, even a, a business partner for the president, and politically. This is something I discovered afterwards because she was very discreet in uh, telling him off, you know, never did this in public, or, or criticizing what he had said or done. But uh, I learned afterwards that she actually did it when they were alone, you know. And uh, when you read her advice, and her remarks, her evaluation of a situation, it's most of the time on the dot. So I think she was very valuable to him also as a political advisor. And I wish Lady Bird well. I know she's not well these days, but again, typically she had a stroke. She was incapacitated. She still is to a certain extent because speaking is difficult for her. But typically of her, she smiles, she looks well. Um, she attends even public events, I was told, and, um, and she goes to rehabilitation, you know. She has this positive outlook, which is wonderful, and I hope to see her on the occasion of this visit here. Good. Uh, Matilda, thank you very much. This has been a very, very, uh, thank uh, you. a very productive session. I want, if, if there, I want to have a, a short interview with Daphne, if there's a... Okay. Yeah. Um, but this this is wonderful. Thank you Thank very much. Thank you. And we'll we'll unhook you and that